we will now be moving on to our next one. We're going to have John Adler come on, and he's going to be talking about Mevconomics uh, for modular blockchain stacks. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, so today, I guess I'll be talking about MEV economics uh, for modular blockchain stacks. Uh, and I'm going to start with what appears to be blockchain 101, uh, but if you bear with me, it'll become obvious why we kind of build intuitions by construction starting from the beginning. Uh, so what are some components of any blockchain protocol, not just a modular blockchain? One, it has a leader selection algorithm, uh, and these are some of these things uh, will, you know, will you'll have heard of them from previous talks, uh, especially the ones that we're going to deep dive in today. Uh, so this is basically uh, an algorithm that tells you uh, who is permitted to actually produce new blocks. Because you know, a blockchain that can't, that can't have new blocks added to it isn't particularly useful. Uh, then tying into this, you need a civil resistance mechanism uh, in any kind of decentralized blockchain. You need some decentralized permissionless blockchain. You need some mechanism to prevent someone from just spamming a bunch of potential candidate leaders. Uh, and that's going to be the civil resistance mechanism. So things like proof of work, proof of stake, etc. Then you have a block validity function or a state transition function. Uh, effectively, the rules around the validity of the execution of a block independently of who got to produce it. And then finally, uh, to wrap all of these up together, you have a fork choice rule, which uh, which allows you, well, by you, I mean the nodes, to distinguish between two otherwise valid chains. So two chains that have the correct leader, that has sufficient civil resistance of like amounts, whatever you want to call it, and the blocks are all valid, uh, you need some way of distinguishing between these two otherwise completely valid chains. Anyway, and we're going to focus primarily on the first and the fourth, fourth one of these, uh, because things like block validity, yes, the specifics of the block validity function determine what MEV may be extractable. For instance, Bitcoin may have less extractable MEV than, for instance, a Turing complete blockchain like Ethereum, but given that just a few days ago we, we saw Reorg on Bitcoin because of an NFT mint, maybe that's, that's not actually the case anymore. Uh, but leader selection and the four choice rule are definitely things that come into play uh, with MEV. So uh, this is the only slide that will contain theorems and corollaries. Uh, so please bear with me. But the first theorem is that in any decentralized blockchain, it's required that the leader cannot halt the chain on their own. Uh, statistically, of course, you know, if we're talking about proof of work, uh, if one person gets really, really lucky, they can just produce every block forever, uh, you know, sensor the whole chain, etc. Uh, why, why do we want this to be the case? Well, because if one party acting alone can completely and permanently halt the chain, uh, then they effectively have the ability to destroy it. And if they can destroy it, then they can, they, it's isomorphic to having control over it. Uh, as, as a coach from Dune would say. Uh, now, a uh, corollary to this is that if you're given some, some uh, if, you're, uh, if a actor is given access to sufficient civil sufficient of like the civil resistance mechanism amount, uh, they should be able to become a leader for at least one block in some finite time, again, statistically. Uh, and as long as this is true, then you know, the system is permissionless. So decentralized permissionless is all it's all very good. The general way this is done is, I mean, there's leaderless protocols like Avalanche, but you know, here we're not going to into too too many specifics. The general way this is done is that if the assigned leader doesn't act within some finite time bound, then another entity becomes a leader. Okay, so why is this important? Uh, the reason it's important is that the leader can capture MEV uh, either directly or indirectly uh, through things like arbitrage, front-running, standard attacks, etc. Now, generally, it's hard to manipulate who is going to be the leader because the leader is tied to a civil resistance mechanism. For instance, proof of work. You can't just like, you know, show up and say, hey, I'm the leader. Uh, you kind of have to do a whole bunch of work. Similarly, in proof of stake, you know, various proof of stake protocols like Tendermint or Gaspro or whatever have pre-assigned leaders. You can't really manipulate the leader in any meaningful or cheap way. Uh, but there's all the things you can manipulate, which is going to be 
the fork choice rule, which works in tandem with the leader selection algorithm. And it could be easier to manipulate the fork choice rule than it is to manipulate the leader selection algorithm. And manipulation of this could lead to things like time bandit attacks, etc. Then, of course, you know, once once you've reordered the chain, then you're you're also the leader of those blocks. So then you can also engage in front running, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, within a single block or a sequence of or a sequence of blocks. Uh, now these may not be that much of an issue in an L1 context, but we'll soon see why there's such a concern and why they're so much, so much more flexible in a modular context. So what is the modular world? Uh, we're moving towards a multi-chain and specifically modular world where you have uh, shared data layers that provide a very high amount of data bandwidth, such as Celestia or ETH2, I guess Ethereum nowadays. Uh, and then a number of execution layers or roll-ups, sovereign roll-ups, element roll-ups, whatever you want to call them, things like Eclipse, uh, Arbitrum, Z ZK Sync, Optimism, Starkware, Scroll, Astria, just to name a few. There's there's countless of these already in development, many already deployed, etc. Now, uh, in this multi-chain world, or rather, if we're really if we're really being general, this multi-domain world, uh, a lot of the current concern is around cross-domain or horizontal, as I like to call it, MEV, where you have MEV that comes from arbitrage and other opportunities within two different execution layers, within two different roll-ups, or to any domains, really. Uh, but, and this is obviously, you know, a very important problem, etc., but it's not going to be the topic of today's talk, or to lightning talk, I guess, it's 15 minutes. We're going to be talking about and exploring what I would call a vertical MEV in the modular blockchain stack, which is the MEV relationship between the rollup and the data layer. And this could, of course, extend to multiple rollups on top of the rollup, et cetera, et cetera. But this is like a vertical relationship instead of a horizontal relationship. Uh, and now you might be looking at this and saying, well, there shouldn't be any relationship between these two because you know there's two execution layers Trades are being done on one that might create arbitrage opportunities on the other. You know, you can atomically execute transactions on each, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but if you have a, an execution layer and a data layer, the data layer itself doesn't have any arbitrage opportunities because it doesn't execute anything. So like, how, how, why would there be a relationship between these two? And this is why this is an interesting problem because it's not cross, it's not cross domain MEV. Uh, in the same way that this horizontal MEP is. It's very different. Uh, and for this, we're going to keep in the back of our minds the tongue-in-cheek first law of cryptodynamics that MEV cannot be added or removed. It can only be moved from one layer to another. Uh, or put another way, MEV can't be you know destroyed. It can only be changed from removed around from one layer to another. This is, of course, not actually like a formal law. It's just a tongue-in-cheek observation. Uh, when dealing with vertical MEV specifically, not cross-domain MEV. So, uh, when it comes to building a execution layer, building a roll-up on top of a data layer, you need to have some mechanism, just like in any blockchain, to produce new blocks. You need a legal selection algorithm, right? Uh, but you would also like to leverage the data layer for security, because if you don't leverage it for security, then you're kind of losing half of what you get out of the modular blockchain, right? You get you, you can get the ordering and you also get availability. Uh, it would be nice if you can you know, use use the blockchain also for ordering, uh, because if you only use it for availability, now you have like these synchronization issues between you know one blockchain's consensus and another blockchain's consensus. You would like ultimately all consensus to be done ultimately only on the base data layer. And if everything else, use some mechanism of merge consensus instead of their own completely independent consensus protocols. Because then if they use a completely independent consensus protocol, you'd have synchronization issues. So what do you want out of a leader selection algorithm for one of these rollups on top of the data layer? Well, you would like to decentralize the sequencers. If you just have one sequencer, you know, the censorship concerns, there's potential for MEV monopoly and MEV extraction, regulatory concerns, etc. Also, decentralizing sequencers is a very convenient and easy way to introduce a token, right? Just have a token, some stake-weighted mechanism, round-robin, you know, leader selection, just like Tendermint has. Uh, it's a great way of introducing that. Uh, 
what else you want? Do you want strong liveness guarantees? You don't want it so that a single sequencer going down, for instance, means that the role goes down forever. Uh, you'd also like to minimize trust assumptions here. Uh, you don't want the trust that a single party is operating or you know, a small number of parties are operating correctly for the chain to operate correctly. Uh, and also you want to minimize waste of the data layers block space. And waste can happen if there's some sort of contention, et cetera, where two transactions uh, show up and one of them becomes useless and it just wastes the data layers block space. You, you, you like to avoid that. Uh, you, what you don't want, though, is you don't want the MEV to bleed down to the data layer. Uh, and I gave a talk at, I think, the M some MEV, MEV summit back in back, back a while ago, quite a few months ago. It's linked in the last slide of this. If, you're, if you have access to the slides, it's, it's uh, the YouTube link on the last slide here. Uh, that kind of dives deeper into this. So I won't dive too, too deep, but the intuition is that depending on the leader selection algorithm, you can have MEV bleeding down to the base layer. And why do you not want that? Because uh, now you have a situation where, you know, if you have a bunch of MEV bleeding down to the data layer, you have all of this MEV to be captured that instead of being isolated to the individual rollups is all going down to the data layer. And all that MEV to be extracted means there's some centralization pressure on the validators of the data layer to actually extract that MEV. And we would prefer that the MEV be isolated as much as possible to the individual execution layers that create that MEV. Now, there's a problem here, uh, and this is somewhat of a, I don't want to say open resource problem, but rather uh, still an open challenge uh, that we would definitely, if you're an MEV researcher or et cetera, if you're interested in uh, modular blockchains, uh, please absolutely reach out to us uh, so we can, you know, brainstorm on, on this problem. One thing we can't guarantee is that rollups don't necessarily care and aren't necessarily incentive aligned with the best interests of the data layer. They have their own interests, their own economic interests, et cetera. Uh, and they m may just do something bad for, for, for the data layer. We, can, we can't exactly guarantee that they won't do that. OK, uh, so let's maybe go over a few uh, examples of potential leader selection algorithms and slash fork choice rules that you could have for one of these rollups on top of the data layer. Uh, one of them is first come, first serve. Uh, so the intuition here is basically a bunch of people just post blobs that are that have a particular namespace uh, or that have a you know that say this blob is for this particular rollup. Basically, when it, when it's, that's what I mean by namespace. A bunch of people will post blobs completely permissionless, per permissionlessly. The first person who posts the blob to the Celestia block for the namespace is the one that is decided, is selected to be the leader ex post facto. Uh, what are some issues here? Uh, it means that the leader is ultimately decided by an auction on the base layer. Uh, and auctions, as, as we know, in the blockchain context, uh, well, you either have to trust the auctioneer, or if you know, the auctioneer is permissionless, uh, then auctions can be manipulated. But I guess auctions can be manipulated by either case. It's just a trust assumption rather than a permissionless assumption. Uh, auctions can be manipulated, so that's not great. So this has the issue that it introduces a PGA uh, for who gets to be the leader, and it therefore bleeds the MEV that comes from the auction down to the data layer. On top of that, it also wastes a bunch of space, uh, block space, because all these other transactions that aren't the first still go on chain and they just don't do anything for the application, so they're useless. Like they pay fees, yes, but it means that more block space is being used without providing value to end users. Uh, another example, uh, Tendermint style of leader rotation. This one is fairly straightforward. It's basically you take just the leader selection protocol of Tendermint, not like the whole quorum and the voting and rounds and all like the P2P stuff, just the leader selection protocol, which is like, I don't know, 20 lines of Go code. It's, it's, very, it's very straightforward. Uh, and then based only on the state within the rollup, so you don't use anything about the ordering at Celestia or anything like that, or the data layer, rather, more generally. You use only the state in the rollup. Uh, and the fortress rule is trivial because, well, Tendermint is work free. Now, there's issues here, which is that as a safety rather than liveness preferring protocol, this kind of scheme makes it a bit more challenging to uh, have good liveness because as if you use Tendermint on an L1, you can increment rounds very quickly. But if you're on a rollup, potentially you have to wait one or more data layer blocks uh, in order to say, okay, this lead, this 
the leader for the slot didn't actually post their block, therefore we will you know, up increment them around and rotate the leader permissionlessly. Uh, another one is highest priority first. This was a proposal that was floating around uh, just a few days ago. It would require a protocol change to Celestia or the data layer. It's basically the intuition is introducing a field, a priority field that can be malleated by the block producers, the data layer block producers, uh, and that serves to order the blobs instead of just the fees, for instance, or the position in the block. Uh, now, the issue is that it actually degenerates to being isomorphic to first come, first serve, uh, except the auction, instead of being done on chain, is done out of band and opaquely, which may be even worse. Uh, last example before I close it off uh, is base rollups. Are base rollups base or cringed or cringe? Uh, so the intuition here is base rollups are based on uh, work that I did, uh, minimal viable merge consensus from 2019, so like basically four years ago almost, uh, combined with MEV boost or some PPS time. Then the MEV boost is used to prevent waste. Uh, of course, you introduce additional trust assumptions since we know MEV boost isn't completely trustless. Uh, so this is maybe a side grade rather than a strict upgrade over the work that I uh, published four years ago. Uh, now, sure, you prevent waste, introduce trust assumptions. What are the issues? You still haven't mitigated the use of an auction to select the leader, so MEV still bleeds down. Okay, uh, I was asked by Tina to add a slide on how this ties into ME MEV economics. Uh, someone will have to come after this and tell me specifically and like co concretely and completely what MEV economics is. But I guess this ties into MEV and the economics of MEV bleeding across a vertical blockchain stack. Uh, a lot of the work, ideas, thoughts, proposals that I listed here were, didn't come from me. They actually came from members of the Celestia team and others. I'll list some of them here non-exhaustively. So there's Connor, Rutul, Evan, Callum, and Gabriel. Uh, they worked very hard on these kind of things. If you have access to the slides, there's a link to their socials. Uh, if you click on the bubbles here. So please follow these people on Twitter, or GitHub, or whatever. They're very bright, and they're the ones who did a lot of the work on a lot of the ideas and proposals here. And if you want to do further reading, as is tradition uh, in the blockchain space, there's lots of prior art. So I posted a bunch of links here with a variety of proposals, intuitions, counterpoints, etc. Okay, uh, that's about it. Sorry for being like a minute over. <laughs>